Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. This is video number 17 in my series, an introduction to freediving and spearfishing California. Today, we're using a three-pronged pole spear in the shallows for monkey-faced eel. Let's go. So these pole spears are made out of fiberglass, and this fiberglass can grip really well on certain dive gloves, but other dive gloves, it slips a lot. So before we get started, I want to show you how to put a really simple grip on, and it gives you a nice anchor point so that you can hold that pole spear securely the whole dive. Now if you're wondering whether or not your gloves are going to grip this pole spear, the easiest way to do this is go outside, go someplace safe, load up your pole spear, point it in a safe direction like down into the sand or down into the ground because you want to find out if your gloves are going to grip the pole spear or if it's going to slide straight out of your hand. You don't want to find out if that's the case like on your couch and shoot a hole through your wall or something worse. If it holds easily then this may not apply to you. If you can't hold it easily and it slips out of your hand then putting a grip on it is essential and putting a grip on it like this takes like five minutes. I'm going to go over the top so I've got a little X there. Go over it again. I'm just going to run it down. Back up. No knot. I'm just holding it. I'm going to put the tape on and then I'm just going to work my way down, keeping it nice and tight. And that's it. Today our story begins in the intertidal zone as I'm kicking out through here through the shallows. Now you can see a lot of seagrass in here and what I'm doing is just kind of navigating between the rocks to find a safe way out of the really really shallow water and into the open ocean. Now monkey faced eels which is our target species for today they like the shallows but I don't want to be too shallow. If I'm in, you know, two feet of water, three feet of water, any kind of swell that might come in is actually going to catch the reef and curl over and become a, a breaking wave. So the extreme shallow water can actually be quite dangerous. I always tell clients when I take them free dive spearfishing that entrances and exits from the ocean are actually the most dangerous situation you're going to be in the whole time. So now that I'm out in a little bit of deeper water, about six to eight feet here, I've got a grip that I already um, taped up onto here a while back so it's a little beat up but works beautifully you can see where I'd put my hand obviously I'm not going to hold the pole spear with a light in my hand but that light is going to come into play later on in the video so the water was a little bit murky but if you've been watching this series you know now that murky water definitely does not stop me and I get a lot of good catches in murkier conditions and since we're going to be working the shallows it really doesn't matter if you have six feet of viz and you're in six feet of water then you can see the bottom so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm tracking a nice big rubber lip perch here. There's a little black perch in the background there. And um, a lot of people would be inclined to take a shot at that first perch, but look at the second perch here. It's even bigger. So that's just a, a reminder to you folks that if you drop down to the reef, just wait a little bit. If you see a fish, maybe hold onto the reef a little bit longer and wait for the next fish because the next fish is often a lot bigger. Those bigger fish tend to be warier and it takes them a little bit of time to come in. But anyway, we're not hunting perch today, we're hunting monkey-faced eels, or monkey-faced prickleback. So to start out, I'm going to swim through this uh, rocky reef in here. I'm basically just looking for any kind of indications of a small cave. Everything I'm swimming over right now with all these boulders, stacked on boulders, guaranteed there's eels all through this. You're never going to find them out swimming free. They're always going to be in a cave or a crack or something like that. But as I'm swimming through here, I'm mainly just looking for a decent sized cave that I can drop down and check out. Of course on the way I find this red rock crab. It's a nice big male and I just couldn't help myself. Whenever I see these guys, you know, I'll probably grab one out of four and then I bring it home. I'll cook them, freeze them, and then later on I make crab cakes. They're delicious. So as I always recommend, dive with your buddies. This is my buddy Will and right off the bat Will found a nice little cave with a black and yellow in it. So he's breathing up at the surface here. He's doing exactly what he needs to be doing. Watch his body form there. His fins are not moving at all. That's rule number one, stay calm. And that's exactly what he's doing. 
laying on the surface, breathing up, and now he's gonna do a nice duck dive and get down. Now it's super duper shallow, which is why his fins are kind of moving around behind him because he's still relatively buoyant, and that's because he's waited for deeper water. So he gets his shot here, boom, and then floats right back up to the surface. Here's Will with a nice black and yellow. Good shot, buddy. So here I'm showing you, I'm using the light. The light is absolutely essential. If you want to see a full review on this light, I did it a few videos back. I really like this light. It's compact and super bright. So here I am dropping down and I'm just kind of illuminating the caves and crevices. Um, my mask is actually about two inches lower than the vantage point from this camera. So it looks like I'm actually not able to look that deep in these caves, but I'm looking as deeply as I can. I'm pretty much laying on the bottom. So that's really important is to get your body down very, very low. And that way, when you light up a cave, you're not just seeing a small portion of what's in there, but you're really getting your face in there. Using the laser here to kind of illuminate uh, a scallop in the back. It wasn't particularly big, so I left it. But uh, at this point, I'm in about six feet of water. I drop down the pole spear to mark it, and then um, I'm putting my face back in this cave with the light so you can see this. That is the tail of a monkey-faced eel. So obviously, I'm not going to spear a tail. I have no idea how big this is, and a tail is a horrible place to shoot it. So I'm going to swim to the other side of the rock now, drop down, and see if I can see the head. And sure enough, there's the head of the eel. Now, I don't want to linger here because I don't want to spook the eel. So I'm just going to kind of do a little pass by, hit the surface, mark the spot, breathe up. And then when I'm good and ready, nice and calm, a full recovery on the surface, I'm going to take my deep breath, clear my ears and drop back down. So now I'm all set up and ready to go. The problem is I'm using a pole spear in one hand and the GoPro in the other hand. <laughs> So I can't use my light, and so I get right back down to the same spot. I can't even see the eel, even though it's in there. So I hang out for a little bit, and then I'm like, yeah, this is just not going to work. So I swam back up to the surface for another short recovery uh, from my short bottom time. Just hanging out here, and then I notice off to the side another eel. Bam! Got the shot right behind the head. And this is about the moment when I realized that that was a huge eel. I mean, I could tell that was a big head, but like that was a big eel. So I've got it pinned down. It's wrapped its tail around the rock. It's trying to pull the spear out and trying to get back in the cave. So I realized this footage is not particularly good. There was nothing I could do about it. Um, my head mount had broken, so I was trying to hold the camera in my hand. But anyway, this crazy uh, fight here, I ended up going back to the surface. Luckily, it was very shallow, so I kept pressure down on the pole spear and then ended up diving back down and dragging the eel out of the hole. So here's that eel. Now, when I dragged it out, I noticed that even though this shot was uh, kind of behind the gill plate, a little bit further back than I would like, it's a little higher up on the eel too. So it would have torn out if that eel had kept fighting. So here's how I kill uh, my eels. I cut right through the gills. That bleeds them out so they can't breathe. Um, exposes the heart right there as well. And I go all the way through the spine, and that'll kill it very quickly. And as it's dying, it also paralyzes it. And then I'll um, usually put a blade through its brain after that. But cutting through the gills and the spine um, is the quickest way that I've found to kill these while they're in the water. So here's some footage from uh, a previous dive. This is my buddy Andrew. He's dropping down, um, hunting an eel in here, and he's using a spear gun. So the spear gun is definitely recommended. Um, what you want to do is aim so that when you shoot, you can shoot through the head of the eel. And that way, the flopper will deploy, and that way you can drag that fish out. You can also use a pole spear with a flopper. So he gets his shot and drags this eel out. Now he kind of popsicled this eel, um, but, and that's, that's actually why I'm going through here trying to cut the gills, but I'm finding that it, that's kind of difficult because there's a spear shaft in the way. Um, so when I do cut the gills here, instead of cutting the spine on this particular eel, I'm going to go and I'm going to cut the spine uh, from the top rather than cutting the spine from down below because I can't get through that spear shaft. But either which way, I'm trying to get through the spine so that it kind of paralyzes the eel. It's not going to be a perfect paralysis, but it definitely limits its mobility afterwards. You can also see the cut in the side of the head of the eel there. Um, that's how I go for the brain on these guys. So Andrew's going to um, gut this out because he punctured the guts with the, um, the spear there. And so uh, these are vegetarian fish, and so vegetarian fish have absolutely horrible smelling guts. Um, so you want to get them out as fast as possible. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but the meat-eating fish that have like a half decomposed or half digested fish in their gut, 
they hardly smell at all. But these fish that eat uh, seaweed, like this, this eel, it's horrible. So you want to gut it immediately, and if you gut it like this, that's fine as long as you're doing that in the ocean. I do not recommend gutting it this way out of the ocean, but I'll show you how I gut my eel uh, here in a minute after we get out of the water. So back to the dive at hand. I took a deep breath, dropped back down, and um, my buddy Will had found a couple of these massive red sea urchins. So he was able to get a, a beautiful red sea urchin that he's going to take home to his family. And uh, at that point, we just hit the surface and started cruising back through the inner tidal and back to shore. And that right there is my PB 25 and a half inch eel. So when I'm guiding, whether it's poke pulling or free dive spear fishing, whenever I talk about eels, one of the first things that people say is, you know, I've always wanted to go for one, but I wouldn't know what to do with it once I caught it. So let me show you how I clean my eels. First things first, get a two by four and a couple of nails. You wanna make sure that you stretch this thing out so your nail here really grabbed and pulled on that eel so it's nice and tight to the board. That's the whole reason we nail it down. That keeps it from moving all over the place and makes it a lot easier to make clean cuts and to not miss meat. So the first thing I do is puncture through at an angle. Now that way I don't cut the gut. I'll put my fingers in and I'm going to run the knife blade right between my fingers cutting out and away from myself. My fingers in the gut cavity push the guts up on the inside of the gut cavity keeping it away from the knife blade. That way I don't puncture them. Then I'm going to sever pretty much where the throat is. There's a little bit of membrane that I need to cut through here as well. And then the last thing I do is I'm going to pull the bladder aside and I'm going to cut right into the meat, right around the vent. Um, this way I actually have never even nicked the, the gut at all. And that way none of that nasty fermenting uh, seaweed from the gut is going to contact and impact the meat. So there's no way of tainting the meat here. Then I'm going to run my knife along the bloodline, run my thumb through there and give it a rinse just like I would with a trout. And then I'm going to go through and fillet it. And so all I'm going to do is just run my blade on both the upper portion and the lower portion of the eel. And then uh, right along the area that would have ribs, but they don't actually have pin bones. And then I'm going to flip it over and finish from the other side. Now this time when I'm nailing it, I'm actually hanging the head off the side of the board. And when I nail it down, that allows me to have that kind of area right near the collar, um, just a little bit flatter, right flat to the board. And that allows... Uh, me to be flat with the blade and therefore be much less likely to miss meat. Now you can see I'm peeling back the fillet here and the reason I'm doing this is to keep some tension on it so that I can make nice even slices and that way I'm not scoring into the fillet and it comes off as one nice even piece. Plank eel filleting method and if we hold it up to the light you can see straight through it. Not much waste there. So I'm going to pour some boiling water over the top of the skin and I'm going to scrape it with my knife to get rid of the slime. Then I'm going to rub a little bit of oil on those fillets and get my coals going. I'm going to do a very simple veggie dish here. I'm not really going to go into the details, but carrots, cabbage, salt, and oil, a little bit of garlic, saute that up. So I'm going to make a simple unagi sauce, which is soy sauce, mirin, sake, and brown sugar. And I'm just going to stir that together, get it up to a simmer, and boil it down until it's nice and thick. I'm going to start by grilling my eels flesh side down, and then once they're about halfway cooked and I've got some grill marks, I'm going to flip them over, and I'm going to finish them with the skin side down. After I flip them, I'm going to bring my sauce out and heat that up, thicken it up a little bit more, and then I'm going to use a basting brush, and I'm going to baste both the meat side and also the skin side of the eel. And I'll repeat this process a few times as it's cooking to get a nice amount of uh, sauce and flavor into that eel. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is put it all over rice, put it in a nice little bento box and bring it to the beach. Very nice. All right. So the eel looks perfectly cooked, nice and juicy still. That texture is awesome. It's uh, it's way more firm than you'd expect from like a perch or, or even a rockfish, a lingcod. Um, and you know, this happened the last time I grilled it too. 
it's uh, it's like chewy, not necessarily in a bad way. The skin is a little extra chewy though, so I'm gonna take it off the skin. I don't know if I'm convinced that grilling it is the right way to do the skin. All right, I'm taking that piece off the skin. That's good. The sauce is beautiful. I think I could have thickened that sauce a little bit better, maybe cooked it down a little bit more. I was trying not to uh, keep this on the grill too long. Next time I'll make the sauce ahead of time. But yeah, that's, that's good meat. Mm. The other really cool thing about the monkey face prickleback is that it's a very low trophic feeder. Because it predominantly eats seaweed, that means that it's actually much less likely to have heavy metals in it. So it's one of those you can eat more frequently than, say, tuna. I'm going to experiment with eel a little bit more. When I've fried it in the past, it's been, I think, a bit more pleasant. I guess I'm not surprised that my very first go of trying it unagi style is not the best recipe I've ever made. Still really good though. Definitely worth experimenting. If you got any tips or tricks that I didn't try here, let me know. I'm gonna polish this bowl off, and I'll see you next time. And until next time, keep the old ways alive. All right, this part is super simple. All I'm gonna do is start wrapping. So I'm gonna put it right here, and I'm just gonna go right over the top. That's gonna to hold it in place. <laughs> is it though?